Are you looking to run a horror adventure this Halloween? <laughs> then you're going to want to stick around as we speak to an expert on that subject. Hello and welcome, heroes, to the Crit Academy. I am your host, Justin. And I'm your guest, Phil Beckwith, the head honcho and the big cheese over at PB Publishing. <laughs> yeah. I'm your co-host, Ian. And I'm your co-host, Brandon. <laughs> we hope to inspire you with creative content that you can bring with you on your next adventure. All righty. I am so excited. Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate it. We know Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> anytime. I'm a big fan of your content. So uh, before we really get into, you know, the, the meat and potatoes of why you're here, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do in the world of Dungeons & Dragons? Yep. So I'm, uh, as I said, the, the big cheese over at PB Publishing. So I, I create D&D 5th &D, uh, edition Adventures more than anything else, uh, publications, but adventures more than anything else. Um, I've got a few of them around here, as you can see. Um, Best-selling DMs Guild and Drive Through RPG author. Um, I'm, I'm most most known probably for the Haunts series as well. Mm -hmm. And we so played two of those games actually. <laughs> uh, I am a I am a huge fan, so I want to uh, thank you again. Um, if you guys are interested in checking it out, you, you really need to do that. Um, where is a, a good site place for them to catch you um, to follow along with your, your exploits? Yeah, yeah. Follow me on Twitter. It's the best place to go. I think it's like wherever you put the uh, the tag. The, the tag. Uh, <laughs> at PB Publishing one over on Twitter. It's the best place to find me. I'll, yep. I, I, that's where I'm most active. You can find a, a link directly to his content uh, that we'll be discussing, uh, which I cannot recommend enough, The Haunt, uh, on our blog at CritAcademy.com. Uh, if anybody is available to toss that in the link, that be link in that channel would be great. So, um, now, you write D&D &D Adventures, obviously. My favorite that you have run so mm -hmm. far that I've really dug into <clears throat> is Horror, which is the, the campaign theme that we're going to be talking about today you know the the mm. um there's elements that make a dungeons and dragons game a horror theme right there it requires a specific type of element so um mm. now obviously there's a few things that an uh, adventure specifically needs um to uh you need to include something terrifying right <laughs> yep there needs to be tension right. and there needs to mm -hmm. be scares so let me ask you yep. how does the haunt capture that what are some techniques you used okay yep so horror tension and scares uh so uh, something horrific um for the horn i think it, it all comes down to the atmosphere of of um setting up those scenes so in the in the whole the, the, the whole first half of, of the first um adventure in that trilogy is is mostly just setting up the scene and allowing the the, the, the players to learn the, the the history and the backstory of this mansion that they're walking through. So the whole bottom floor of this mansion is all them learning this backstory bit by bit, and they're throwing in a few monsters here and there. But it's not it's not monsters at all really until you get higher up. Um, so setting that tension early is is important. And it's all about um, setting the mood, right? So, um, for instance, they, they go and into this big ballroom and there's, there's this scene that's giving you sort of this ghostly apparition of, um, of, of these two having a dance and then talking about this, this backstory of, of, what's, of what's happened in the past. And, and, and the players slowly learn the history of this place. And that's just, and it's, and it's really written in sort of um, dulcet tones, you know, keeping it really low. And then when they move on and something happens, bang! All of this, all of this um, action happens, and all all of this horror spills out at you. And because you've held back and kept the kept the tension tight earlier on, it really just impacts moving forward when you do release that horror. Yeah. And I think your your adventures capture that really well. And um, mm. one thing that I really noticed, I, I grew up with child's play. Everybody <laughs> else grew up with that. So yeah. 
it, it was very uh, reminiscent of my childhood nightmares when I had this, you know, has this little doll running around terrorizing people. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was a lot of fun for and me. Look, at, keeping that tension as well, like the, when you first meet the doll, it's not attacking you at all. It's right. just a doll, right? Mm-hmm. It starts a lot, a lot of players put it in the backpack straight away. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorite things about this adventure. Everyone I've run this with, I always ask them, it's like, hey, what do you think the doll looks like? And it's different for everyone. That's so, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I like that. Um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, the horror and the tension. Um, you know, horror being, you know, mm. death and gross things, which are generally related to that. Then you have <laughs> the tension, which is what's really pulling the the players into the experience right What's around this corner what's around this? Is there right. something in that closet That's right yeah actually, i actually saw a meme that they yep. post in the D D group of a uh, wasp nest was built inside a doll so oh, <laughs> so <laughs> so you know and then the the we talk about the scares that really come from the release of the tension generally in an unexpected way yes um and i you mentioned the yeah, atmosphere correct. and this really comes uh, in place when you do attack the five senses more than anything else. Actually, before we got started, Ian had a mm. really good example of this. If you want to share that with everyone. Right. Like one example is I think it's a good idea to write out descriptions of areas you're going to go to ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the more you describe, the more you personify something, the better. Like it's one thing to say you enter a dark tunnel. It's another, another thing to say you guys enter into the tunnel. The only light comes from your torch. But the darkness seems to drink it in as you proceed down into it. Fuck that. In, in words like drink it in, that personification. Oh, I mean, I look at is, Brennan's reaction just mm. now, just from that. I think that those are important, in my opinion, because you're you're making the world around them seem alive, even though, well, okay, in D and D it could be, I guess, with mimics and shit. But mm. um, but generally making. It, yeah, yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> Well, well, that's that's one of the things I try. I think I try, personally try when I'm writing is to at least um, when writing descriptive text, at least describing three of the senses that they're getting at, not just uh -huh. what they see, what they smell, what they hear, um, what they feel, or uh, if, if it's cold, you know, the outfit is cold, or if they, you know, they they can smell the the acrid, um, the, you know, the acid um, down in the sewers, or they can. You know, um, they feel the, the, the hairs on the back stand up, you know, like you said, all, all the senses, but including at least three, I think gives a well-rounded mm -hmm. um, description without uh, being too much. Too much, well. too much. Uh, yeah. Because there, there is you gotta a leave a little. You got to leave a little bit for the imagination as well. Yeah, it's yeah, true. for sure. Um, one of our <laughs> listeners actually has a really good, uh, good example here where he says, when you describe something completely normal, um, but each time you describe it, introduce uh, an inconsistency that will slowly uh, leave little clues and unravel oh, okay. it as you as you go do it, which <laughs> is really interesting. And I think in the haunt, when you first yep. see the, the the little doll thing, all you see is its eyes like peering through the window, right? Um, or at least maybe that's how I ran it. I guess I don't right. remember. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> it's been a, right, been a right. couple no, years. No, you're right. Two little crisp blue eyes. Yep, are yeah. just poking through. And that's, that. okay, you know their eyes, but you don't know to what. And then you walk in and you describe, you see this little, you know, child's play creature thing sitting there all innocently not doing nothing. <laughs> and then you can correlate, oh, you a closer inspection, you know that the eyes are a little blue. You know, and it just kind of goes a hand over hand as you 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 move through it. <laughs> that's right, and that's sort of bringing that tension back and back and back. Mm -hmm. You want to talk yeah. about tension for this this particular game? Uh, it wasn't just that there was the doll. <laughs> I put more than one doll mm -hmm. into it, and only one of them was real. But they all mm -hmm. had sapphire eyes. Oh, like they're just planted throughout the house. Ooh. Yeah, like w one of the rooms was Ooh. just a. Uh, <laughs> Doll, doll, dollatarium mm -hmm. or whatever, yeah. where it's just a shelf of dolls with blue eyes, and they're like, I don't know, <clears throat> dude. And you could totally have yeah. them moving yeah. around and stuff, like the other doll is grabbing them and moving them, so it looks like there's. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, just behind it. them, not moving their heads and stuff. <laughs> then you got to That's where that perception perception would really come in. You see little scuffs, uh, scuff marks on the on the ground, you know, uh, uh, that weren't there a moment ago, as you heard the skittering across the floor, you know. You know, building off that, I can, I can see actually a strong argument for horror games in particular, and of course, make sure your players are okay with this. Right, right. Is make sure that yeah, yeah. As, instead of having the players roll for perception and all that, have the DM roll it behind the screen. Mm -hmm. So, so, so mm. obviously, you can get descriptions like 
You swear you see something move in the corner of your eye, but when you dart that direction, there's nothing there. Mm, shadow people. And that's interesting because you take away, because there's no matter how much we try, we know that players, if they know they got like a three, are going to respond as if they got like a three on the roll. So I do see yeah. that there is a benefit yeah. to that because they're not going to have that meta knowledge to know how high they rolled to determine what they see, you know? And so that's really interesting. It's the same, yeah. It's the same as what they did with uh with Tomb of Annihilation, right? With the navigation rules, yeah. where you with the DMs rolling the um the the survival check behind the screen, because mm-hmm. otherwise they know that they they've gone lost, right? It's right, the same right. the same deal. That's a that's a really good example. Um, so yeah. and we we touched on a, a little bit with this this little doll in this example, but uh, beyond that, um, sudden you you he gets a real sort of uh, back. Uh, you learn something about him that gives you a bit of empathy for him and you're like oh maybe it's not so bad but then he's probably going to die it's so, <laughs> they're setting you up for this <laughs> it's such a cliche in horror movies nowadays you can i'm not sure you, can, you, pick, yeah. you can pick people it's like oh yeah he's done oh it, it flashed out for a second. <laughs> yeah, he says he's got two weeks left until retirement you know he's fucking dead <laughs> <laughs> This is how it works. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Oh, um. So, but that just sort of leads into the tropes. Okay, right? we're back. And, mm. and, uh, tropes are handy as well. Yeah. Um. So we got the uh, uh, the ability to use the uncanny and unknown as a tool for fear. What do you mean? Uh, the uncanny means mm. a situation, object, surrounding, uh, surroundings, or a person that is off from what it should be. It's a peculiar mm-hmm. situation or sensation, like something in your gut that is telling you to run away. What makes dolls and clowns so creepy? That's a really good example because they're meant to be funny and adorable, but it's uh, something that's you know. yeah, right. They're, it's something that is just off about them, and I think the the well, I hate to go back to the, mm. the child's play, but it does it really good. It's meant to be a doll, but it looks like it's going to kill you <laughs> but it's not because it's got like uh, a damaged you know face or it's ripped apart it just gives an unsettling feeling and i think that you can apply yeah. that to a lot of inanimate objects mm-hmm. um and especially in a game of D where you can make things come to life like animated armor um i think that that even makes it even more so yeah um, the, the fear of the unknown haunts us all yeah. the time yeah it's simply means a situation unfamiliar to us is uh playing out we can end up yeah. dead in a number of horrible, <laughs> frightening ways, and information about our surroundings is key for security, which is uh, actually something to remind really? me as to why uh, that video game Dead Space was so terrifying, successful. It's because the person who made it, he was also on sets of like uh, Friday the 13th and all those old horror movies, and he specifically says the best form of horror and fear is the absence of horror and fear. Yes. So mm. when I was younger, yes. I was playing the 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 Doom. The, it was like the new 3D Doom, right? Doom three. And yeah, whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I will never forget this stupid hallway. I walked down this hallway with my little flashlight. I'm terrified. I was like, something's going to jump out at me. And so I'm looking around. I can hear things yeah. crawling in the. Th- and I get to the end of it, and I was actually devastated that nothing jumped out at me. Like my heart was racing, and there was nothing. <laughs> like the expectation the old drove day. me. That's right. It's like the original Alien movie, right? You don't even see the alien for like a good two thirds of that movie. Yep. Yep. Um, but it's, it's all about the tension and looking around corners in dark places, um, and and just seeing sort of the the, the traces of, of of the alien. Mm-hmm. But you don't see the alien, so it's all that tension building up again, and um, and it's the absence of, of the horror as well that that keeps that tension there. Right. right. I, like I going off of that. Like, I, ha- I don't watch horror movies in general, but many of them I have watched. I've lost count of many times I'm like, hey, we're going to get a jump scare in three, two. <laughs> and you can predict it. Right. Yeah. And that kind of, for yeah, me, at least, gives me some attention. But there are some that I watched, like, uh, I'm drawing a blank on there. What was the uh, Stephen King movie in the hotel? <laughs> the Shining? Yeah. Like, there was what? Yeah. Like, the best jump scare was, like, I was just, I did the count on my head. I'm like, wait, nothing happened. <laughs> You're like a, like a and I, and then it happened. <laughs> oh my! Yeah, Twenty-five sec. <laughs> Twenty-five seconds later. Popped up. I like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, yeah it's clever. <laughs> but also, one thing that you always want to do too is we got to develop a spooky setting. 
Oh, yeah. Obviously. Jinky. <laughs> like, building a horror setting should be a fun, creative exercise. And we all know the creepy elements mm. of a place that can send chills down our spine. Graveyards. Yep. Really? Mansions, second houses. Me. Building out what we've gone Basement's over better. so far, though, you can start yeah. building a setting that brings the fear to life. So how does uh, so I couldn't agree with this more because I'm terrified of cemeteries, which is weird because I don't believe in ghosts. I've never seen one. I have no reason to believe that something's gonna crawl out of the ground and attack me. Yeah. But it is so uncomfortable. <clears throat> what what are some se- or, or settings that the Haunt trilogy takes place in that really brings out that um, that horror theme? Yeah. So there's uh, uh, I guess there's two major settings in the trilogy. Uh, there's an old uh, ancient haunted mansion uh which you don't really know is completely haunted until you get into it but um you could probably tell from the from the outside and people <laughs> go into it knowing right so this place is haunted so they already know how they should be feeling uh walking into this place they're already feeling uneasy looking at it right uh-huh. um, and the other one is is a is a is an old uh ruined sanitarium or or old hospital right. um that, that just sets my <laughs> spine on <and> chills. <laughs> well, and I, I agree with the hospital too because um, hmm. you, there, so much darkness happens in a hospital. And so yeah. when you're in a place oh, yeah. where it's dark and you know people have died here, I mean, that's that's worse than the cemetery. At least the cemetery, they arrive dead. <laughs> here in a hospital, people die <laughs> yeah. and they come back. Yeah, this is where it happens. <laughs> Every time I walk to a center, yeah. it's like, oh, okay. And then all, the, and then all the other stuff that sort of happens, right, to to their bodies uh, before they're dying as well, which is probably worse. Right. I tell you what, if I walk into a cemetery and I see a gravestone with iron bars over it, then I might be afraid, because <laughs> they're trying to keep something from coming out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're prepared. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, Grandma. I love you, but uh, you did me wrong. I ain't here. You go back. <laughs> you put raisins in my fucking cookies. Check in the closet. <laughs> oh, yeah. my gosh. So uh, so a setting is certainly important. Oh, and, yeah. And it's not just the, the location, but the way the location is presented. You know, a house isn't mm. spooky unless it's rickety and falling apart and dark and right. dusty yeah. and cobwebs you know so the 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 dungeon dressing or the event the setting dressing is just as important as the setting i mean mm-hmm. once again if you watch any movies or read any books the 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 horror of the hospital when it's covered in bright lights isn't that terrifying but as soon as the lights go out and all mm. that's on is the emergency red lights right. it becomes significantly more terrifying mm. So those are the things you really want to touch flicker, on. Flickering light or something like that. Oh, yeah. You, you know what's terrifying? Oh, my yeah. God. I had to help my wife uh, hang uh, uh, art stuff. Helping his her... wife is terrifying. Yes, that's terrifying. <laughs> I had to help her hang all his artwork up in one of her schools, and we kept the, the lights off, so all we had was sunlight coming in through the halls. Mm-hmm. It's very, very – it's creepy. It's dark. There's no one there. There's lockers everywhere. And if you've ever played Fear – Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have to walk through a school. Makes and me, makes me cry. Every time I turn my back, I'm like, I think of that fucking game. <laughs> yeah, there was. I remember playing that, and there was a little girl that flashed in a scene. But it was one of those things: looking through a window and then turning and looking through the same window. Those things uh, really are opportunities yeah. for um, uh, to really get the 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 element of surprise and fear there. You know, especially when mm, it, yeah. a, a party wanders through a hallway and nothing happens, and then they have to come back through the hallway. And something happens because they 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 what is it their 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 um, expectations is oh we already been through here so there's gonna be no issue um, and I think mm. I did that really uh, in the haunt I think I did that where there is a chandelier that falls if I remember right yep but I didn't have it fall <laughs> right away they passed through that area a couple times before it finally just uh, crushed cool. somebody <laughs> they're like why yeah. did it fall before they're like that's a good question is something following us. <laughs> Um, so that should have been stable. <laughs> you know, I remember reading a few articles for yeah. the uh, demo for the game PT, which was supposed to be a prototype for the for Silent Hills. Mm-hmm. And apparently, everybody described like, mm-hmm. if you want this like perfect horror tension, this demo seemed to nail it. And hackers, when they tore that file apart, found out like the main monster. They actually had it following you the entire time. 
That's terrifying. <gasps> so you were always uh, being followed. <laughs> dude, you could totally get away with that with like a, uh, what is the, the invisible stalker, right? That's kind of its shtick. Yeah. yeah. Um, but instead of it just outright yep. attacking you, it pushing and moving and pulling things to instill Something that. into you. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I love it. <laughs> Which kind of. So it's, like, it's like Jaws. It's like Jaws, right? When, when the sharks come up and bump them and they're like swimming in the water, but they don't see it. Yeah. They've been hit by something, right? So that that's that's another sort of form of of terror there, I think. Fear of the unknown. Yeah. What was that touch my leg? I know mm. when I'm in the ocean, I hate going in the ocean. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> Actually, like one thing I can't wrap my head was like, let's say like the player subscribe marching order. And you of course describe like, yep, you hear the footsteps, and like you say, like uh, tell each individual player what they hear, and then like uh, like you hear foot. You guys march forward, you hear footsteps behind you. Wait, wait a second. I'm in the back of the line. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make or, any sense? <laughs> or, me or, or messing with their senses, you know? You hear footsteps over over to the right, and then, then you, you feel something brush up against your neck from behind, and that just sort of sets off conflicting senses, I think, is, is a good one, too. Mm. Oh, um. Yeah. So that leads us into our, our next uh, kind of talking point here. And that's uh, building a significant threat. To build tension, our killer or monster or ghost needs to be a serious threat. This is the case with most tabletop RPGs in the genre, but it's important to reiterate mm. this point of heroic games as well. Oh, oh, yeah. And I feel like this can become mm. more and more difficult potentially the higher level your characters are. Yeah. It's like, oh, no, we're stuck inside this hell of a dimension door. I'm out. <laughs> Plane <it's>, walk. <laughs> it's something Vanish. that I absolutely love about the haunt. I haven't checked out the... Or polymorph, uh, like, like the big giant mess into a squirrel. <laughs> I haven't checked out the second haunt yet, or the third one. Yeah. But in the first one, yeah. yes, every creature in there is a major threat to the players, and not once do they mm -hmm. ever see it coming. Yep. Yep. That's what I like yeah. the most about them. Yep. <laughs> can, we, can we just... Uh, I just want to yeah. show everyone this for a second. This is... So you... You've had three of these, and you just released your your special edition uh, uh, book here, the the Haunt yeah. trilogy. Um, it's very mm -hmm. difficult for anybody that doesn't know to get a physical books on DMs Guild. Yeah. So kudos to you for yeah. achieving that. Um, Thanks, man. Uh, I know that that yeah. takes a lot of Jeez. work. Yep. <laughs> oh, or Garwin. Oh, even better. Yeah, it's been in the making for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Tell the second to last person in the line they say don't hear anything behind them. The wizard was taken by a face spider. <laughs> yes, I approve of this message. Um, so actually, I guess cool. we only got one more point on our notes before we get in, because I do want to talk about some of the stuff that you've done in here yep. that I think is really clever and really unique. That's unique to this book as far as I've seen. I mean, I don't own any book that's similar to it. So yeah. um, uh, we mentioned uh, the build a significant threat. Um, this ties in with don't be afraid to kill your characters. Um, Player characters. Yes, characters player characters, whatever character, any character, um, because that also steps up the level of fear because a good example in, in, in the haunt, when I ran it, um, my, you go through the, the, you see the little vision, uh, that happens in one of the, like the dining room or something. And then there's a place where I don't remember if there was already a weapon there or I just placed a magic sword, but there's a zombie beholder. It was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in in the pool <laughs> i yeah i had a player who was gung-ho on about getting that thing and it because the other player characters or players weren't willing to leave them to die even though it was due to their own you know uh mm. incompetence i guess i don't know the right word <laughs> a but, different player yeah. died from that encounter uh, <laughs> yes another player died from it by this the disintegration ray thing <laughs> that i that i used and yeah. um and that player was always mad at the other player because he only died because the other player t wanted a weapon. And would not retreat. And would not retreat, yes. Um, uh, and But that just shows, like, once that happened, they're like, all right, maybe we should go somewhere else. <laughs> this place is dangerous. Right. Now, this does, to me, double down on something I always think is important to RPGs in general, but even more important with horror games your actions have consequences. Yes, absolutely. That's super, super important. And um, I think that that really becomes out in horror uh, horror themes more so than regular D&D &D style games. Yeah. Um, and there was one for my players is on the second floor. 
when they realized that there was such a massive threat because they took care of the whole the whole problem because mm-hmm. they had their own strategy and tactics it's like okay that was pretty smart that worked when they got upstairs there was the uh, the ghost if you remember correctly i do the person who found the body got possessed like that she just snagged them. Mm-hmm. What they do? They go to the laundry room where there's that big bed of water, mm-hmm. and they try to drown them. <laughs> <laughs> Time to drown, biatch. And then they can't get get them to release. So, uh, uh, the cleric, I think, they had um, mm-hmm. great water, great and destroy water, great destroy water. They got rid of the water, and after the ghost noticed the water was gone, they screamed, did psychic damage to them, let go, ran over the stairs, unpossessed him, and threw him down the steps. <laughs> Oh, that's God. awesome. I love that. Um, it's brutal. And they're like, fuck. <laughs> or a good way to mess with a player's perceptive senses is make one player in particular think that they're surrounded by monsters and they start attacking them. Yes. But actually the other party members. Oh. I ran I ran an adventure where I did that. I, I restructured the, the mass suggestion spell to be more like mass fear. Yeah. And it created basically the mm. the, 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 the what is it? It's psych uh phantasmal force? No, the other one. Uh, phantasmal oh, killer. killer. Yes. Which is basically the, the psychic you see your worst fear and it you turned me all... feel like a complete dick one time. I I cast that on somebody. I don't remember. <laughs> it was a giant <laughs> I still don't remember. I play so much DD, I'm sorry. <laughs> when I cast on like the fire giant's wife. Oh my god, yeah, you're such a dick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the dick. <laughs> well, I was role playing that. Anyway, so uh the other thing I wanna uh, uh, touch on um is that uh to do horror, there has to be don't be afraid just to set we talked about the setting, but don't be afraid to make the players where the players are physically at um, setting the atmosphere, which Phil touched on briefly when we started with dimming the mm. lights and having creepy music. And those are all things that really, really help um, fill their imagination with these yeah. thoughts. And because of that, don't be afraid to include a more physical aspect to the game. So when I ran The Haunt, I had... Uh, pre-worked out with my wife that i would call her at a certain time there's a part in the adventure where you're climbing up the stairs and there's some pounding or something coming from the end of the hall on the other side of this door and um and so when they were creeping down the hallway step by step they're worried you know they've been running into this little demon devil doll thingy and they found a flesh (laughs) golem in the basement and some shit and so they're getting kind of carried uh, curious so i had texted her i was like hey i need you to get out here and so if, if for those of you don't know my on my the show studio in my office is uh, separate from the house so i texted her she came up to the outside of the door of the room we're in all the lights are dim we only have candlelight and then when i i basically she could hear me through and i says as you guys approach a loud thunderous bang and she started slamming on the door and they all jumped <laughs> out of their seats <laughs> And so, to me, yeah, cool. um, there's you can do more than just, uh, you know, using words to 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 describe uh, the the scenario. You can get more physical with it. Um, don't make anybody uncomfortable, though. Oh, definitely. So yeah, I would say if they peed themselves, I would count that as a win. Well, it depends on what kind of de- <laughs> uncomfortable you're talking about, too. I mean, it's one thing to mention to your players, like, "Hey, I am going to ru- run a horror game. I will screw around with your emotions a little bit. That's what we're going for." Yep. Yep. But as I mentioned before, mm. I had a DM in one game who actually screamed at the top of their lungs like an ear piercing shriek, and it was so loud it actually made me physically hurt my my ears, and I kind of want to punch the guy. Not gonna lie, <laughs> <laughs> I've done that something similar with an air horn yeah. under the table. So yeah. there's definitely a line there. Yeah. Um. So uh. uh yeah, there's absolutely a line. Yeah. Um. So now I want to talk more about your book because there's something very specific about this that really separates it uh, from other things. But before I do that, is there anything you want to talk about that's in it that we should uh, cover that really helps and uh, really helps people run the great horror adventure that is the haunt or something similar? Yeah. Look, um, I think you touched on it before with the setting the atmosphere is a is a big thing. It's, I think we, uh, I put it in the first few lines of the or at least the first page of the book is just setting the scene, or setting the the room up. Um, use dim lights, use candlelight. That'll bring the whole experience in into the table, into the middle of the table, and keep it between yourselves, the players, 
no distractions around. The, the darkness beyond the table is not there. Um, and that really just brings it all in and, and really sets that, that tone, that, that sort of um, dulcet tone, which you can then boost up whenever mm-hmm. you want. Like you, you'd be talking in, in uh, really hushed tones while everyone's in at the table, really focused in what's happening and then bang! You've got a, you've got a there, ready to go, you know. <laughs> just slam that table, and they won't be expecting it, and that that'll just set set the heart going, that'll set the tension, and that'll set the tone for the entire game. Yeah, um, and you you really do a, a good job of providing guidance on those in the book as well as in this episode. So thank you. Um, but there's some stuff you <laughs> did in here that I want to talk about because I want to know how you came up with the idea. Um, first of all, uh, yeah, okay. you have customized character sheets for your adventure, which I think is yeah. awesome. I, the little creepy doll staring at you is um, a terrifying thing to look down at every time you're looking at your character <laughs> sheet. So uh, kudos to, to you at that. But yeah. the thing you did... Yeah, that, 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 was, that was a good friend, Dante, he, who, who put that together for me. He's an ch- absolute champion, yeah. really, really good. <laughs> so yeah, he, he did a really good job on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, And uh, something I'm actually seeing on some posts, just because it's now October... People are seeing a lot more Halloween or horror themed posts in general, especially in D&D mm-hmm. groups. And one post I just read actually pointed out something that I actually pointed out in chat the other day, which is werewolves can't hurt each other in 5e since their claws are neither magic nor silver and they're immune to non magical bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing. <laughs> How they keep themselves from wiping out themselves <laughs> in a fight. And I just think that's something to keep in mind when you build creatures in general or run a horror themed setting. Yes. It's like, oh, it's like, oh mm-hmm. no, these worlds are fighting each other. They can't hurt each other again. <laughs> um, so the thing I want to talk about and I want to ask you about is you put in yep. here special sheets that track the encounter and have yeah. the yeah, monster stat one. blocks, have the monster stat blocks and everything on like a page, which yeah, yeah. is um, just so cool. How did you even, how did you even come up with that idea? I really just wanted the book to be grab it off the shelf and you've got everything you need other than your friends and your dice. So in this book, you, you can, you've got everything pretty much. Uh, you've got your maps, you've got your, uh, you've got your minis, you've got your um, encounter tracker or your initiative tracker. It's got initiative down one mm-hmm. side. You've got the, um, you've got each monster in there. And that's, I, I made one of those. I filled out one of these sheets for every single combat encounter right. expected in, in in the entire trilogy. So you've got you've got a big, thick uh, lot of the encounters. And they're look, they're designed to be used as as a textbook uh, to use at the table in that book. And now I know a lot of people aren't gonna wanna <laughs> write in their book or cut out <laughs> things from their book. But that is it's designed for that, right? So right. um so they they used to be so you can track uh, notes so you can track HP on on those sheets at the table. It's got everything you need all on one page, nice. ready to go for every single every single combat encounter. It's got a separate one. And what's even cool is you have some that uh, like if this encounter only had a ghost in it, you have uh, blank spots you left here that you can fill in your own monsters if you want to enhance yeah, the, right. the combat. Which once again, dude, this is awesome. So one thing that. So uh, we'll talk about it here in a minute, but in one of the, the adventures we just wrote, one of the things that I hated about all the books I have is all the monsters in the appendix. So I'm constantly flipping back and forth, yeah. and it drives me bonkers. Now, I do yeah. understand that makes it easier to find, but in the same token, I'm using mm-hmm. it right here. This is where I want it. And so being able to either scan yeah. this or print it off or just rip it right out of the book and sit it on the table for easy Have reference right. is fantastic and very clever. Yeah. Not to mention the paper and minis. Look Go ahead. I was just going to say, and that just uh, leads into being able to run a, a great horror horror game as well, right? You, you, you don't want to be breaking immersion with by flicking through a book. You want to have it all right there. Ready to, you want that flow just to keep going because you're, you're setting that scene and it's all about the, that atmosphere. Yeah, I, I love the, the paper minis that are in here. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about those? People can see. But... Guys, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Um, yeah, the... the, the uh, Held up one of the paper minis made up in front of the camera. Yeah, I was Everybody. trying. It's oh shit, I'm, I'm failing. Things. <laughs> but there, there it is. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, look, um, that was uh, the, the, art, the artist that that made those is Paper Golem. So go check uh, him out on 
uh, Patreon, I think, is his best place, or or um, Twitter. But he's awesome. So he makes. He, I've seen him. Make, he's made a whole heap of um, paper minis for a lot of the heart, uh, official hardcovers. Uh -huh. So and he's a fellow. He's a fellow Aussie as well. So I've got. I got in touch with him, and um, and he was able to come on board to do all these paper minis. So basically, I've made. Um, we've put into the book every single unique uh, monster. So if there's five, say five uh, maniacs, we've got five maniacs in 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 the, you know, one of the appendixes that you can just cut out and okay. use at the table. So so we've got one one mini per each individual monster throughout the entire book. So That's you've nice. got like heaps and heaps of these minis to to put together. But look, the, they're ready to cut out and and fold up and put straight onto your table. Awesome. I, I, I wanted everybody to, to be able just to have that experience and, and not be using, say, a coin for, for a ghost or whatever. I wanted them to have a mini that they could put down That's as fair. part of purchasing the book. I wanted them to have everything that they possibly have that right. you could get from a book uh, to make that experience as special as possible. And obviously, you did put like perforated like, uh, pages on there. And I Obviously, not everybody is like comfortable with like tearing actual pages out of the physical book, but that doesn't mean you can't scan it. That doesn't mean you can like uh, print it from a PDF. <laughs> we have it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so I, I, I offer offer a PDF version as well, and um, yep. and I offer if if you buy if you buy the hardcover, there's also an option to buy the hardcover with the PDF for at no extra cost. Nice. Of course, I know that people aren't going to want to. People aren't going to want to cut out the books as much as it's designed for that. They're, they're not going it's to. It's an ex so, excellent uh, marketing uh, <laughs> ploy, by the way. Kudos. Yep. Yeah, yep. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, mate. Excellent marketing ploy. Hey, you can cut these out, but since I know you won't, here you go. <laughs> you can get the PDF too for a few extra yeah. dollars. <laughs> you, get, you get the PDF for free. So, yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, okay. I want to put it out for another buck. Like hey, another buck. Anyways, um, so. <laughs> I'm a greedy bastard, apparently. Uh, anyways, I love the haunt. I love running horror, um, and I think uh, one exactly. of the reasons I invited you on is because I think your adventure really nailed it. Um, no matter how many times I run it, that theme comes across. So, um, if you're you yeah, look, big shout out to Travis Leg as well. He, he he helped me write the second and third uh, modules in in the trilogy, yep. and he did a fantastic job with with a lot of his stuff as well. That's in there. So he, he did a, he did a lot of a lot of work on that as well. Wonderful. It does occur to me that we didn't touch on the fact that don't be afraid to use like uh, props or other tools. Like, like if you're out playing in person, you can like dim the lights, or you can use like a uh, music yeah. soundboards. Hey. What have you? We did talk, we did about, talk that. about that. <laughs> Must have been in chat. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Like a fun one though is like a play a heartbeat in the background on low volume. Oh my god. Thum, thum. Yeah. Thum, thum. Right. And as you thum, thum. Raise, up the raise up the tension, increase the heart rate. Oh, fuck you. Ooh. Really cool one I like to use is a, quite a funny one. It's um, it's the SpongeBob SquarePants theme slowed down by eight hundred times eight hundred or something like that, ah. and it's freaking is fucking. Um, <laughs> I'll have to go, check go it look out. Go look it up on go look it up on YouTube, and it is and it is so unnerving. Um, and it's just the perfect background sort of ambience, not even music, it's just ambience. I, th I thought you were <laughs> running a horror theme. Horrible. Why is this titled SpongeBob SquarePants? Yeah, don't worry about That's it. That's right. But man, <laughs> have a look at it. It's, it's I will. Cool. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for our main topic. Uh, before we move on to our unearthed tips and tricks, we have a shameless plug. Um, we, we have to, yeah. we've, we've spent talking about the, how awesome the haunt is. Um, now we want to talk to you about something we're working on. Shame. <laughs> Shame. Yeah. Shame. Uh, one of the best parts about role-playing games isn't just the fantastic battles. It's the memorable locations that they take place in and the interesting NPCs that our her heroes, heroes, heroes encounter. <laughs> we are so excited to announce the Extraordinary Expeditions at Lunchline Kickstarter on October 12th. Yeet. <laughs> Yeet. Extraordinary Expeditions is inspired by one of my favorite adventure themes, Dungeon Delves. Modular adventures that can be grabbed from the shelf and ran with little or no prep at all. The adventures are written in such a way that everyone at the table gets to experience their favorite pillars of roleplay. <sighs> oh yeah. 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 Uh, the first adventure <laughs> from Extraordinary Expeditions is called Far Touched, and you all get it free right now. 
on our homepage at CritAcademy.com. It's true. Assuming the wife has fixed the link because I just checked it and it wasn't working. So <laughs> to be determined, you can also head on over to <laughs> <L-E-edit>. <laughs> rebrand.ly slash uh, ex- uh, extraordinary dash expeditions. Um, uh. Oh, she says she fixed it. You're good to go. <laughs> so please consider uh, picking it out, uh, picking it up, checking it out. Um, I really, uh, a lot of work's gone into this. Uh, I want to thank RJ Productions, who's also partnered with us to do this. So mm-hmm. hopefully you guys will like it. If you're looking to top off not just the creepy horror theme with the haunt, but Far Touch deals with a lot of alien far realm type stuff which is just creepy in and of itself so consider checking out it is free if you do like it please leave a rating or review and help other people find it and maybe back us when the kickstarter goes live all right that'll do it let us move on to our unearthed tips with this fancy transition and now what you've all been waiting for our unearthed tips and tricks segment where we bring you new and reusable material for both players and DMs. Uh. All righty. So, Ian, would you like to tell us about our uh, character concept today? Our character concept is Charlene Pumperstamp, (laughs) a female gnome. (laughs) Say that five times fast. I keep using that joke too much. (laughs) Her description is she's uh, runty and weak looking and she wears a long yellow cloak, which she also keeps her silver hair in a pixie cut. Her eyes are a deep amber and her teeth are white and near perfect. Personality wise, she's a lively one, has a spring in her stem and bounces in her breeches, quite literally. She is obsessed <laughs> with dancing. She constantly tries to fill her life with a variety of dancing. Her brief stint in her town's militia gave her the idea that she was invincible and is the toughest woman alive. That could have a poor ending, potentially. (laughs) And as part of her history, she grew up in a lower middle class home, but lived comfortably, which for her wasn't enough. Cursed with vampires in a very young age. Oh no. That escalated quickly. Charlene has worked very hard to control her curse. She hopes to save up enough money to one day pair, pay a clerk to remove the curse. And her motivation, her name or reputation has been wrong in the past by brigands. And she desires to make it right. And if she can make a name for herself as the Dancing Queen, well then that's alright too. Dancing mm-hmm. Queen! queen. <laughs> I'm sorry you guys! Going out on, on evil. <laughs> You can blame my wife for that one. They're having like some big comeback to her thingy. Anyway, so oh, uh, what do you think about shit. this uh, character concept, uh, uh, Phil? Um, <laughs> interesting. It reminds me of uh, what was that movie where there was that? I think it had it was an interview with the vampire, something like that, where there was uh, one of the characters was it like a little girl? Yeah, um, that was an interview with a vampire. Um, vampire yeah 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 that just never grew old or you know uh-huh. um forever forever young but forever old in the mind as well so yeah it could be a tragic character i sure. love it <laughs> because um she's very upbeat and lively that's something that honestly i don't generally see at a dnd table um uh, her reliving those moments with the One she loves, and so she's making new memories, knowing they're gonna. Die. I don't know. Just it seems so deep to me. They could be so deep if you you play it right. So yeah, absolutely, that's a lot of depth. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I just thought of fucking Kevin Bacon's uh, solo dance from Footloose. <laughs> we're up on again. Yeah, I can't do nothing about that. It says we're recording, but uh, we're recording, but it's not. Uh, it it disconnected from the internet. For our character <laughs> concept. Um, our monster variant of the podcast is the Remnant Oozling. The origin, you're going to start with the stat block of the Minotaur, because we like to give you guys, you know, most of the hard work done for you with the CR and everything, right? You're going to lose sight, language, and its great axe. We're going to give it some new features. Damage resistance to acid, cold, and fire, because, you know, it's an ooze and shit. We're going to give it immunities to blind, charmed, and deafened. And we're going to give it a blind sight out to 60 feet which means it's blind beyond this radius. We're, of course, going to give it the amorphous ooze ability that um, 
Uh, so long as the ooze doesn't have uh, uh, any bones engulfed, it can move through a space as narrow as one inch wide without squeezing. But Justin, that's weird. What do you mean bones? Well, let's get into get into that in a second. <laughs> We're going to give it a bloodied condition, which means when the ooze has less than half of its hit points, it compresses and releases any bones that it may have in an explosive barrage. Each creature in a 15-foot radius uh, cone or sphere... Uh, Around the ooze, must make a deck save or take 66. Uh, I put piercing. That probably could be better bludgeoning or piercing, depending on how you want to roll with it. Yeah. Um, on a failed save or half as much on a successful one, the creature then abandons the bones and attempts to escape until it finds a suitable replacement. So what are we going to do? We're going to give it the shape changer on top of that. So now that it explodes, it also can cha change shape. So the remnant, yeah, the remnant ooze uh, can shape and change its form by engulfing a set of creatures' bones that is large or smaller. The process takes 1d4 hours, depending on the size and uh, how much of the corpse flesh remains that needs to be dissolved. Upon completion of taking the new form of the bones, the ooze takes the general form and features of the bones. This is its strength, dex, and hit points are all the same as the engulfed creature. Additionally, it gains any physical features the bones may have possessed during, uh, before being consumed. The, ooze, uh, the ooze's slam damage is reflected by the shape of the bones consumed. The damage die is 1d6 for small creatures and increases by an additional d6 for every uh, size beyond that. We're, sorry, there's a lot here. Up to large. <laughs> uh, up to large. Yeah. We're, we're also going to give it corrode metal because it corrodes shit. That's what it's going to do, which means it's going to give penalties uh, to weapons and armor, which can destroy it. Uh... And the ooze can each eat, eat through four inches thick of non-magical metal in one round. Now, we're also going to give it the slam, which I promise is the last ability. <laughs> we're going to give it the slam, uh, which means it does bludgeoning damage plus acid damage. Um, you can get the stat block for this on our, our Patreon page if you want the whole thing or on our show notes on our website. And the target, if the target is wearing metal armor, uh, its armor is partly corroded, which then deals a cumulative minus one to its AC. If the armor penalty is reduced to AC of 10, it is destroyed per a lot of the, the oozes to begin with. That's a lot to unpack. Um, so I have to ask, Phil, what do you think about this uh, remnant oozing? Other than it being a five-page stat block? Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Now this thing can be. Oh, this is something you you set up in a dungeon way ahead of time, and this is something that you introduce to them as possibly an NPC that you can then start to that, that they'll, then they'll start to sort of see things happen uh, with that shape change, right? Yeah. Um, that you know they touch you and, they, and it sort of stings a little bit with a burn or think, some, mm -hmm. things like that, and start introducing. Parts of, parts of it, its um, abilities to them and then bang, ex explodes with bones in the <laughs> middle of the party. <laughs> the, uh, I'd love to hear what, uh, what do you think, Brandon? I can see the DM being a total dick with this creature. Yeah. And that, and that is that, uh, uh, what, what was it? That's ability where it can uh, squeeze through anything to try to escape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What if it's trying to squeeze through the dirt and stuff and trying to figure out how to, how to get out and it just so happens to stumble upon... Bones? Uh, uh yeah uh Tresk bones <laughs> well it got all up to large oh up to large okay <laughs> so maybe it'll just be the Tresk head i don't know um <laughs> so the thing i really liked about this is uh waka, 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 waka. honestly i can't take credit for this idea um in the in the the mistborn series they have oozlings that consume bones and shape change they're contras i think uh, uh and uh i took this idea from that because i love the idea of having a well-defined enemy that won't stay and fight to the end, but when it comes back, it can be the same monster, but clearly be stronger. And that, to me, is yeah. really intriguing. Um, because it's one of the few... I, I don't know that there's very few monsters that actually says it will run away. <coughs> I don't know if, if you can think of any, uh, Phil, mm -hmm. but... Yep, Kendra's in the mysteries. Yeah. So, uh, this definitely... And plus, if they do <laughs> fight it, it exploding in their face is a surprise nobody will expect, and then it can escape through a one-inch narrow passage. Um, means it can really yep. get away consistently. So, um, yeah. Yep. yeah, definitely. I love our users in our chat. <laughs> How to horror. 
Murder mystery where the culprit is a changeling, four level assassin, four level gloomstalker with alert and either mobile or sharpshooter feats, and expertise in stealth and deception, wearing glamorous studded leather. <laughs> Anybody could be the killer. We want to uh, uh, reiterate, we want to scare the player characters, not necessarily kill them. Yep. Um, and yeah. that sounds like they're gonna die. <laughs> That's what Some, that sounds like. Somebody is. <laughs> or so maybe one of the players is already dead and has been replaced by this thing. <gasps> God, that's good. Yeah. Anyways, all right. So that'll do yeah, it for so our our monster <laughs> that variant, the remnant oozling. That's where note passing can come in play. <laughs> right, right. Brandon, would you like to tell us about our encounter our of the podcast? Man, I'm sensing a theme. What is this? What, what, you, enc- don't, you don't like my encounter? Our encounter. Everything is a pun with you. It's true. <laughs> Our encounter idea is called Hello Mummy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds so much better when you say it. Hello Mummy. Are you uh, my mummy? <laughs> Hello Mummy. Oh, it was just another day in the sleepy town of Blackhaven. <laughs> 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 it was just another day in the sleepy town of Blackhaven. The sun was shining, the air clear, and life had returned to normal. The annual harvest festival is in full swing. That was until a tremble ripped through the ground, shaking and breaking. A large rift appears outside, just outside the town, and protruding from it is the top of a pyramid. That's weird. Where'd that come from? It's a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cracks in the pyramid's top allow a strange odor wafts to allow a strange odor to waft through the air. Mmm, sounds like century-old bacon. <laughs> Food and drink begins to quickly spoil <laughs> in and around the town within one mile. Mm. Mummies begin to wander out from the pyramid. The characters are asked to investigate. What makes you think they'd say yes? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, they're going. That's why they're adventurers. If they, if they ignore the, oh, here it's right here. If they ignore the call, the town is overrun by mummies, and the entire area becomes a blight. A character who succeeds on a DC 14 religion check can recall the burial rituals of mummification that helps protect a body from rot. With the help of dark priests, after burial, the dead are raised to protect treasures hidden inside. Mm, treasures, that's a good hook to go through. Okay. Uh, the, characters <laughs> encounter... <laughs> <laughs> the characters encounter a multitude of traps throughout their expedition, such as a collapsing roof, um, poison darts in the, in the hallways, and guardian lightning breathing statues. Because why not? <laughs> They'll get tasered by a statue. <laughs> Deep inside, beyond the Grand Gallery, is the King slash Queen's chamber, uh, along with a horde of artif- oh, artifact. Artifact. I thought it said artificial. Along with a horde of artifact treasures and coins worth two hundred and fifty-five gold pieces, resting on the sarcophagus is a ruby-hilted dagger of venom. You gonna taste my venom? Mm. Ching. Uh, a character who succeeds on a DC 18 <laughs> religion check is aware of the common ritualistic practice of cursing treasure. Once the dagger or treasure is picked up, the pyramid begins trembling and shaking. The characters have ten rounds. Uh, use a countdown die. Yep. I'm a fan of those. I love those. That'll uh, build tension too for your horror games. <laughs> gets down the tube. <laughs> <laughs> to escape before the pyramid sinks back into the ground and be imprisoned until they starve and die. A creature that takes treasure from the lair is cursed until the treasure is returned. The cursed target has disadvantage on all saving throws. The curse lasts until removed by a remove curse spell or other magic. What do you think, Phil? Sounds fun. I love that 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 cursed treasure. <laughs> it just brings them right back in, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, you're greedy. If you want it, you're going to have to stay. <laughs> It reminds me of uh, the movie The Mummy, where the guy is like hoarding all the little golden scarabs, and turns out, oh, psych, you're gonna die. <laughs> yeah, the movie um, gave me nightmares. Right. Uh, <laughs> this is a pretty straightforward uh, mummy uh, encounter. Um, I really like this one because it uh, it does. We do talk a lot about using traps and stuff, and then of course the cursed items. Uh, you can make one item cursed or all of them. I chose to go with all of them. Because players are and characters are greedy as hell, and doesn't matter what they take. Can you imagine them picking something up and then uh, having them, you know, get cursed, and then think, "Oh, I'll take this, I'll remove it, and then I'll pick up something else," and then just keep getting cursed? Because I feel like that's what would happen. Um, I do think that this works best um, at lower levels than higher levels, because if they have access to the remove curse spell, 
Um, you want it to mm. be. Uh, it's it's gonna make it's gonna trivialize that unless everything they touch curses them, because then you're just gonna go through spell slots and then the mummy lord's gonna find you and you're all boned. <laughs> yeah. Um, anything else on this? Anything you would add to it to make it better or more, uh, totally change entirely? <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's great. Mummy rot is it. terrifying too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you're not including mummy rot in your games, you're missing out. <laughs> That'll yeah. do it for our encounter of the podcast. Hello, mummy. Phil, would you like to tell us of our magic item that comes from the haunt? It does from the first haunt. Um. Okay. So this is the leech's emerald from the haunt one. So it's a wondrous item. It's rare and re requires attunement. Uh, this. Green Emerald is the ancient relic imbued with necrotic energies by an, uh, an evil necromancer long ago. Its, ma its master and wielder, once attuned, can attempt to magically implant the emerald into the chest of any living creature. The creature must successfully win a grappling contest to be able to resist that attempt. Mm. As a bonus action, the emerald's master can then use it to transfer three d6 hit points from the victim to the to them uh to themselves if within 60 feet so basically you're just pulling hp across to you leeching off of the uh creature the emerald has uh two charges per day and regains all of it uh all of its expended charges daily at dawn the gem exerts no control over the victim otherwise but the master of the emerald knows its, uh, the creature's direction and distance at all times. If the emerald crosses into another plane, the owner knows which one. Nice. The gem, uh, sorry, uh, extraction, right. So extracting it, a skilled physician can remove the gem with a successful DC-17 intelligence medicine check. But the patient suffers 4D10 <laughs> piercing damage on, e on every attempt. Yeah. Oh no! If they fail that, they're so dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a greater restoration spell can be used to eject the item as well. The emerald uh, radiates evil, and should be and should its master ever use it for its intended purposes, their alignment permanently shifts one step closer towards evil. I love this. Yep. You, you know what I hate about this so, item? Mm. My players, uh, they're reading the, the end of it. Uh, yeah. uh, their alignment permanently shifts a step closer to evil. Uh -huh. Well, they've wanted to use yeah. this gem so badly, and they figured out a way around it. How so? Oh. The cleric paladin put him on himself, making the master the squishy player. So whenever the paladin gave himself temporary hit points, he'd have the players leech off of him to stay alive. Ooh. Oh my gosh. Clever. <laughs> That's very right into his own like chest. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just like Iron Man, he's got a Ooh. little. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, was, it, was yeah, smart, yeah. it was a smart play. But I was like, I'm pretty sure it's not supposed to be used like that. But okay, that's creative. <laughs> that's how you. That's how you do it. You get inspiration. You're fun, man. I really like this because um, <laughs> it really is. Uh, it really defines how dangerous um, the necromancers are in how they do anything to make themselves mm. better. <laughs> like, yeah. well, I've just got yeah. 20 of these yeah, yeah. things that I've created. <laughs> well, okay, you can only attune to three. So the NPC's got three of them, and he's got three servants. He just drains them every day to keep himself alive. Yeah. And mind, you guys ever mm -hmm. watch that Chin Chin Chong uh, <laughs> flick where one gets hurt and the other one feels it? That's kind <laughs> yeah. of what I'm thinking of. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Ooh, get him spider legs. Uh, get him <laughs> remotely. Ooh, I like that. That's cool. Um, I thought this was really cool. I really had a lot of fun with it um, when I ran it. That's why I wanted to include it. Um, mm. To me, the, the <laughs> having the so I, anybody that doesn't know, I, I had the uh, the doll was constantly running around and climbing up on people on their bodies. Um, and when she got a hold of this thing, she was trying to shove it down their throat. <laughs> <laughs> so you know nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right i think that'll do it for our magic item the leechers emerald from the haunt i don't like that what what <laughs> chat just now flesh to sewn into shape stone into greater restoration equals living flesh bricks what the hell not undead living <laughs> 
All right, so that'll do it for our magic item. Uh, oh. Our dungeon master of the tip is no nat 20 auto successes. Set a DC. So no roll in your game should ever require a natural 20. This is an easy trap for new and veteran dungeon masters to fall into. There is a reason why natural 20s are only successful auto successes on attack rolls. So let's delve into some examples. So. Yep. And we do want to reiterate that that is the only time a nat 20 is a natural success is with rules as written. Yes. Um, your PCs want to do something, and you think to yourself, that's nearly impossible. The only way you're going to manage that is if you get a nat 20. Fight the urge to do this. Instead, set a difficulty class. The reason for this is simple. As awesome as a nat 20 is, they are completely random. Yep. Your player's influence is minimal when the dice roll. This essentially takes away player choice, and we can do better than that. So, for example, no matter how many stats, features, and feats a rogue takes to pump into their stealth, a warlock is just as likely to roll a nat 20 in the same situation. Would you guys agree? Yep. Yeah. So, in this example, let's make it outrageous. Let's say the DC is a 35 stealth check to make it past the Watchful Beholder. With a level 5 rogue that has expertise, we can easily attain a plus 11 to their bonus to stealth. So we're already off to a pretty great start, but that only brings us with a nat 20 up to what? 31, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, they're still not really going to get it, right? But wait, the other players have a few ideas. The cleric prays to their deity and channels guidance, which adds a, a, a d4 to the skill check. Then the bard speaks speaks up, giving words of inspiration. The ranger drapes the party and rogue in a veil of shadow and silence, adding pass without a trace to the mix. Now the rogue has a d4, plus a d8, plus 11, plus 10 to their stealth for a maximum of 33. Now we can't forget the d20. So in the end, it's still going to come down to chance. But because of the agency that we've given the PCs, and the choices that the PCs have now made, the chance of success went from nearly impossible to extremely likely. This leads to a feeling of A, accomplishment, that wouldn't have been present previously. So go and set your DCs no matter how hard they may be. What do you guys think? I want to hear from Phil first. Yeah, um, anything that'll give um, the, the players something to think about, a challenge to to try and get past, you know, um, rather than just roll, I miss, roll, I succeed. Make it, it's, it's a puzzle in itself. For sure. And I think that's great. Anything that thinks, makes people think outside of the box um, sort of reminds me of what we did with the Big Bees book. I think you guys covered that too. Yeah, we did. Um, I love that part. Yeah, yeah. It's the, same, it's the same sort of thinking, just thinking outside of the box, which really mm -hmm. makes the game go to that next level. Yes. And... Once again, chat, one of the players says, just because the rogue has a plus 10 in stealth, doesn't mean the enemy can't have a plus 12 perception. The rogue rolls a nat 20, the enemy rolls a 19, enemy wins by one. Yeah. Still, a nat 20 mm -hmm. goes back to anybody can get the nat 20, yep. right? And if you're going to create it as an automatic success, it doesn't matter who rolls it, which is why we are encouraging you to set a DC, no matter how ridiculous you yep. want it to be. Yeah. Um, yep. Brandon, yep. do you have anything to add? Uh, this is a massive debate on TikTok. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm sure it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and for rules, that's that's how I see it. A nat 20 doesn't mean all success. No. Right. It's just the way it is. So um, yep. so the question is, is you guys going to allow nat 20 successes in your games? When it comes to attacks. And nice, that's it. Nice answers. Attacks, attacks only. Yep. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for our Dungeon Master tip. No nat 20, auto success. Set a DC. Our player tip of the podcast is... Don't, don't be a dick. dick. And you can avoid dickitude by listening to Brandon. You piece of... Please hold while his next subscriber he is trying to reach is located. That's all not available. Yeah, I keep freaking turning that off. Anyway, I'm also gone by now. <laughs> yes, that's also true. Uh, let's see, we got here Missile Trap. 
You can avoid Dickitude with missile traps. <laughs> All right. That's also really a good way to cause Dickitude. Yeah, I'm starting to realize when I go towards the op, because I didn't. You, we did early on. We didn't do op player optimization stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm slowly leaning towards people like that, so I'm going to include it, and I've been including it for a while. That's why we cover uh, other stuff. <laughs> Oh, let's talk about how, as players, we don't often set our own traps. Well, you may want to rethink this. Uh, because PCs that have an knack for preparation uh, can pull off some amazing combos. The Glyph of Warding is a particularly nasty spell if you have time to prepare for it. Uh, for this, you're going to want to locate a room of any size. Uh, and for this example, we will use a small hallway that is 10 feet by 80 feet. That's a small hallway. 80 feet is pretty <laughs> long. That's, I think it's more referring to the width. Ten feet is pretty. Anyway, it's a school hallway, man. Come on, who cares? Go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, for this example, small hallway that is ten feet by apparently eighty feet that you can lead the enemy to. This will give us uh, thirty-two five-foot squares. Next, you want to cast a glyph of warding with the spell magic missile stored in the ground with each five-foot area. Now repeat this 31 times, leaving one space blank. We can set a trigger to be anything we want. In this case, when insert evil bad guy's name here <laughs> enters the area, it triggers our glyphs. Each trap releases three missiles for up to 15 damage each for a maximum total of 465. What the fuck? <laughs> Phil, do you want to take that next line? Yeah, so now there's a bit of a weakness with this combo. The first being the, the shield spell can stop the damage instantly. Reminding, uh, remember that uh, that extra area that we left? Well, that's uh, going to cast the Glyph of Warding with the counter spell stored to it. <laughs> set... <laughs> it's brutal. Um, set the trigger to when the shield uh, spell is cast, and voila, that enemy. No. Oh, oh, magic <laughs> missiles. Shield. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Not gonna lie, though. My next question was, yeah, but you can counter spell, counter spell. Counter spell, counter spell. Well, no, I counter the shield, counter somebody spell. else would have to, yes. Because they're using the reaction already to cast True. shield. True, I'm just saying. <laughs> well, yeah, somebody else could, but you can't plan for everyone to have counter spell. I guess you could just... Right. Safety first. Maybe you do 30 squares mm. and leave yeah. two for counter spells. Only counter spell if somebody else counters this counter spell. <laughs> yeah. As a bonus yeah. action, you can break this fortune cookie to use counter spell. Yeah. <laughs> the last issue that arises with this is part of the reason why games should check material components for the cost in games. Yep. Each glyph of warding requires the spell component of 200 gold pieces worth of diamonds. So this example would cost mm. us... 6,400 gold worth of diamonds to do it. That's yeah. a lot of diamonds. And let's, let's be honest, people <laughs> people always say, I'm not going to worry about tracking uh, components. You it depends can, on the spell. You can really break the game when you have access to not the cost. Let's think of uh, 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 many of the more potent spells mm. have a gold cost that is really, really high, and in diamonds specifically, that are harder it, to obtain. That for me is different, though, than yep. just having a material cost cost but it has no gold cost on right it. that's already included and assume you have that material but this right. specifically mm. these require work or using an arcane focus <laughs> yeah yes. but if you have a good potential to off a bbeg for 6400 gold i think it might be worth it <laughs> and you know what hey <laughs> you're gonna invest BBEG. your money i'm down for it now the last note this example only uses uh the uh only the floor in a five foot areas technically you could place these on one square foot areas on the floors and the walls Oh, the right, uh, and make the damage a lot higher. Happy playing! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> shit. Um, yeah, that's... So it's uh, like a portal that they go through. <laughs> yep. So for me, uh, this I, where, do you, where do you guys think that... The, how would this work best? Because obviously it requires spell slots, so it's going to take preparation. If the players have their own guild yeah. hall or place of residence. That's what I was thinking. This is a great way to. Or, yep, go ahead. I was gonna say, or like a sort of, sort of like, I guess a, a, a wizards conclave or something like that, where you've got a lot of wizards or a lot of casters in one place. They're all contributing to this defense system. Um, let's write that down. <laughs> I or, love it. Or if you know where a battle is going to be ahead of time, or can manipulate where it's going to go. 
Right, right. So this this is when everyone says, um, "Oh, I'll just mind control the the king," or "I will cast an illusion." If you don't think that the wizards haven't thought about your cheap ass tricks, don't be surprised yeah. when not only is it counterspelled, but fucking twenty arcane or uh, magic missiles hit you in your ass. <laughs> yeah, like that's the one thing I never understood. Oh, I can just I've got all this power. It's like yes, but so do other people. <laughs> Sure, there's a lot less mm. of them, but I mean, a thousand you can get a, easily find a hundred mages that can cast magic missile. What's the distance of magic missile? I don't know, like a hundred right. feet, maybe. It's maybe actually much more than that. That's pretty Anyways, far. Anything else uh, on this uh, old broken uh, player tip? <laughs> All right, yeah, have fun. <laughs> I guess <laughs> that'll do it for our player tip of the podcast. Don't be yeah. a dick. Actually, yes, be a dick. Be a big day. 120 feet. <laughs> How much? 120, 120 feet. feet. So yeah, a good save, range. Save your gold. Save your gold. <laughs> save diamonds specifically. Like, I feel like if I was going to do this, I would constantly mm-hmm. be like, do they have diamonds for sale? I have 2,000 gold and I'd like to buy as many diamonds as I can. And never even leave up, <laughs> never let the DM what you're on to. Well, it's gold material. It's common material for spells. Common material for spells. And because eventually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be okay, okay, okay. Until you're like, wait, what'd you do in your year of downtime? Um, I set traps. <laughs> Where? Everywhere. <laughs> so, uh, how, how long does the glyph last Until for? dispelled. What's the duration on it? <laughs> or oh, or okay, moves. If go. it, it, it goes off if it moves, I think, 10 feet. But it's basically mm-hmm. until dispelled. Mm-hmm. So, um, Isn't it's terrifying. Isn't a spell that will let you move 30 feet? It doesn't yeah. Really, yeah. There is. There's a lot. Rogues can outrun magic missile. What? No, they can't. <laughs> homing missiles anyways uh that'll do it for our uh, for uh how long uh, that'll do it for our unearthed tips and tricks before we close out as always we like to give away fat loots and we would just like to say mm, thank dumb, you dumb, to dumb. phil for offering to give away a free copy of his pdf of the haunt worth it yes it's a, it's amazing it is um so uh Absolutely. phil can you see who our winner is there today our winner is how do I even pronounce that? <laughs> Does it make me a dick that I always give the guests those uh, pronunciations when I can't yeah, do it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give it a shot. Do it. I R U B A N D E S. I U R I A L B A N D E S. Yes. I, I think I think he, he Congrats. Yeah. yeah, nice. Congratulations. <laughs> Woo! Ooh. Ooh. Would actually be the better way to do it, right? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, we will uh, get you a complimentary copy of that shortly. Compliments of Phil from PV, P, PVP Publishing. PB. I'll get that out to you straight away. Pop, yeah. Bravo Publishing. Uh, all right. That'll do it for our show today. Uh, before we close out, uh, Phil, do you want to give yourself one more plug where people can find you and uh, all that jazz? Yep. Blah, blah, blah. Yep, so you can find me mostly on Twitter uh, where I'm chatting and I'll talk to anybody about anything, mostly uh, RPGs, but I'll talk about anything. Um, and also um, you can find all my stuff on DM Skilled or Drive Through RPG. Just and, look up my name. And, and check it out. He works on some amazing stuff. And I'm not just saying that because uh, he's on the show. I'm saying that because I invited him on the show because I already feel that way. So um, I, I do want to thank you for joining us. Please support him. Check out some of his content. It's all great. Uh, I recommend with Halloween coming up, start with the haunt. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or if you really want to get fancy and you want to run one more than one session, pick up this big bad boy. There's some good shit in here. Um, yeah. With that, um, <laughs> if you enjoy the show and you want to support us, head on over to CreateAcademy.com. Follow us on social media. Right. Uh, leave us a review. Even if you don't use iTunes, all the algorithms use that. So go and write, create an account. It's free and write a review. Um, it's all great. <laughs> I am your host, Justin. I am your guest, Phil Beckwith. I'm your co-host, Ian. And I'm your co-host, Brandon. Thanks for listening. Keep your... <laughs> I was waiting for... Just say it. I thought he was going to interrupt me. <laughs> Keep your blade... Like this? God damn it. I knew it. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Go. Keep your blade sharp and spells prepared, heroes. Thank you guys for joining us today. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> God.